Following From Software's success in Dark Souls 2 and Bloodborne, the creator of the Dark Souls series, Miyazaki, retook the reins to direct Dark Souls 3. Learning from the successes and failures from his predecessors, Dark Souls 3 took many of the refined elements from Dark Souls 2, such as the graphical interface, while the story feels more directly lined to Dark Souls 1, with many areas corresponding to the original game's locations. While Dark Souls 1 depicted the fading of the first flame, Dark Souls 2 portrayed the fate of the flame as more of a cycle, with the rise and falls of kingdoms encapsulating how many struggled to break free from their cyclical fate. This sense of loss is what drives Dark Souls 3, encouraging the seemingly desolate cycles to be put to an end. The Ashen One is immersed into the once glorious land of Lothric, a kingdom that has been condemned to a ruin. The landscape is riddled with signs of what once was, teasing the players with hints of a story that need to be arranged to display a picture as clear as possible, while loudening the presence of the mysterious aura in the Soul series. The many puzzles and deviant narratives resulted in widespread speculation and discussion as to what the true meaning of many of the events in Dark Souls 3 were. An iceberg displays these discussions and speculations into a chart, with the peak of the iceberg containing the often simpler and commonly known theories, and the deeper down the iceberg you go, the more mystifying the theories become. Today we'll be looking at our very own concocted iceberg, inspired by an iceberg made by the Gilionic, but also altered specifically for our viewing pleasure. So let's deepen the shallow waters by investigating the Dark Souls 3 iceberg. Egyptian text in Arch Dragon Peak. A shrine to worship the ancient dragons, the Arch Dragon Peak is a dilapidated structure of beauty. Part of this man made structure includes a stone, right next to the first bonfire, having been covered with Arabic inscriptions, with a hollow resting against the stone. Yondame 8 spent time deciphering these inscriptions, but the text seems quite random and starkly juxtaposed to the Dark Souls lore with Cell 91 actually linking it to an Egyptian article about the Minister of Transport being angry at the delay of development in the Egyptian Railway Hospital. It does seem quite far-fetched that this text is canon, implying that the Arch Dragon Peak is in the Middle East, but many years into the future after civilization fell. Most likely, the text was placed on the stone to give an oriental feeling to the Arch Dragon Peak with buildings in other parts of Arch Dragon resembling other real-life places. The Londor Pilgrims became Pilgrim Butterflies. Countless Pilgrims journeyed to the fabled Lothric Castle for an unknown purpose, with most perishing on their journey. But one, the Pilgrim from Londor, Yol, is still alive, and reveals like the other Pilgrims, he is awaiting his own death. Somehow, I failed to die as was ordained. As the name Pilgrim suggests, it seems that these individuals are inspired by religion, being the religion shared by the Sable Church of Londor, the Church of the Deep. The Sable Church was founded by Lillian, Uria and Elfrida. Curiously, if Uria is killed, she says, Curse, I have failed thee. Now from the Japanese version, this line is better translated as Karth your dying wish was unfulfilled, implying that Karth is no longer alive. But what we do know is that the Sable Church is pushed by Karth, who's a primordial serpent from the original Dark Souls game, who wishes for the Age of Dark to transpire. So perhaps these pilgrims are travelling to Lothric as a message, signalling that the Lothric Kingdom and the Age of Fire is coming to an end, or they're at least trying to prevent it from continuing. But it's not just their journey that makes these pilgrims interesting. They're dressed quite strangely, having chains and a shell that seem to bind and contain them. The cleric set explains that clerics also wore large covers on their backs, and this was to ensure that they would not become seed beds for spreading darkness. So it could be possible that the pilgrim shells are also used to prevent the spreading of darkness, perhaps the pus of man, which is the corruption of the abyss. 
On the high wall of Lothric, we can see hollows in the process of transforming into trees. And strangely, all of these hollows are facing the Lothric castle. So these hollows could have been pilgrims, but perhaps they are in the process of becoming seedbeds and spreading darkness. We can in fact see branches escaping out of Yol and other pilgrims shell. So perhaps this is the seedbed trying to take control, but this shell is preventing it. Additionally, Pilgrim butterflies are an enemy that hint a resemblance to the Pilgrims of Londor, and they themselves can also be found at the peak of Lothric as well. If we examine these butterflies closely, they seem to be made of flesh and bone, with a ribcage jutting outward, which is a strange kind of composition for a butterfly. They also seem to resemble the tree transforming hollows. Gzais suggests that these pilgrims actually evolved from their shell-like state through to a pilgrim butterfly. Could this be why the pilgrims are sacrificing themselves, in the hope that they burst forth as a pilgrim butterfly? The negative 110 theorizes that the pilgrim's initial death is actually that of metamorphosis, cocooning in their ready-made shells and emerging as a butterfly. In the Cathedral of the Deep, there are a collection of statues depicting a cocooned being sprouting wings, perhaps being a pilgrim. This transformation into an angelic form could parallel the transformation of a pilgrim into an almost angelic pilgrim butterfly. The Dragon Slayer armor guards the entrance to the Grand Archives in Lothric Castle, but it lost its master long ago, and is now controlled by the pilgrim butterflies. Lord Stannis Seven suggests that the pilgrim butterflies are attempting to prevent the unkindled ash from linking in the flame, due to the ties with Darkstalker Car. But if these pilgrims were chained, presumably like the clerics, to prevent the spreading of the pus of man and contain the darkness, why would they also be trying to end the Age of Fire, ultimately introducing the Age of Dark? While this could be loosely dismissed as its distinction between the often synonymous use of the Deep, proclaimed by the Sable Church, and the Abyss, Kuman Lomenrod proposes a more matured idea that the pilgrims may have not been actually preventing the pus of man from spreading, but rather germinating it inside of them, and when they finally arrive at Lothric, their mature pus of man blossoms them into the pilgrim butterflies. As for the hollow trees, they could be those that didn't fully understand the pus of man like the pilgrims, and prematurely allowed the pus to take over their bodies, turning them into the failed butterflies that are the trees. But there still is one individual that's been conveniently left out of this theory so far. The stone-humped hag looks the same as Londor Pilgrims, but strangely, when she dies, an angel appears. My time has come, has it? Well, maybe I'll get to see an angel. Could it be, like Sundown Kid hypothesizes, that the Pilgrims' ultimate goal is actually to turn into an angel? tying itself to the angelic faith of Dark Souls 3. Maybe the angels are just part of this transformation, either before or after the pilgrim butterflies. The pilgrims could be under the illusion that they are following the path of an angel, but have actually been tricked by Karth, hastening the spread of darkness. Ultimately though, the journey of the pilgrims cannot be concretely proven or disproven, and like the pilgrims, perhaps we just need to have faith. It's time to awaken in the Cemetery of Ash, and explore the surface of the iceberg. The Archdragon Peak and Untended Graves King Osiris was once a mighty king of Lothric, but he became obsessed with harnessing his blood for a higher purpose, being fascinated by dragons, and ultimately becoming consumed by this very obsession. In a similar vein, his garden, known as the Consumed King's Garden, became a relic for his endeavours both harbouring the pitiful king, and slowly being consumed itself by nature. But the consumed king's garden is also holding many secrets discoverable by the Ashen One. Behind an alluring chest is an illusory wall, which opens up to a faintly familiar place. Known as the Untended Graves, a mysterious and dark area hints at being an ominous twin to the more comfortable Firelink. But this isn't the only area that's concealed by the secretive garden. Found on a Drake Blood Knight's corpse is a path of the Dragon Gesture. This gesture, if used in a rug in the Irithyll dungeon, transports you to the Arch Dragon Peak. Interestingly, when you leave Irithyll, 
the sky is dark. But upon the arrival of the Arch Dragon Peak, it's daytime. It seems that the Arch Dragon Peak and the Untended Graves both fall out of the apparently daily cycle in Dark Souls 3. Champion Gundyr notices these links and observes that the corridor after the Osiris fight reveals through its crumbling cracks portions of a darkened sky, similar to the Untended Graves. And also in these corridors are the path of the Dragon Gesture, so this also links it to the Arch Dragon Peak as well. Furthermore, in this corridor are serpent men, said to have fallen far from the grace of their ancient dragon ancestors. These enemies can also be found in Arch Dragon Peak. So could these places somehow be linked? Champion Gundyr supposes that there is a deep time related connection between the two, suggesting that the Eclipse version of Firelink could also be applied to the peak that we see in the Irithyll dungeon, versus the peak that the Ashen One is transported to. And we don't know for certain that these two observed peaks are actually in fact the same. When we travel to the Arch Dragon Peak, we first meditate, and we don't actually observe our departure, or arrival. So perhaps this Arch Dragon Peak is hiding something more than meets our naive eyes. To help our comparisons, let's spend some time to size up to another point in our iceberg, and that is that the untended graves is in the past. This was a theory heavily researched by Nathan, who went through a detailed exploration of the graves, comparing the untended graves with the quite similar cemetery of Ash. Firstly, we find a body that is now resting in the grave that the Ashen One wrote out of at the start of the game. And ironically, there seems to be Grave Wardens guarding the untended graves. Opening into a battlefield, we are faced with the imminent boss, Champion Gundyr a champion who had come late to the festivities and was greeted by a shrine without fire, and a bell that would not toll. Champion Gundyr emits strong parallels to Eudix Gundyr, looking quite similar. The champion's armour states that the belated champion Gundyr was bested by an unknown warrior. He then became sheathed to a coiled sword, in the hopes that someday, the first flame would be linked once more. Curiously, when Eudix Gundyr is found, he is motionless, with a coiled sword needing to be removed in order to fight the Ashen One. So just maybe, the unknown warrior was the Ashen One, defeating the belated champion Gundyr, causing him to become sheathed to a coiled sword, until the Ashen One arrives once again into the Cemetery of Ash to link the first flame. While strange, it could be possible. Another curious circumstance is that of the Shrine Handmaid, who can be found at the Untended Shrine in the Untended Gardens, as well as the Firelink Shrine. She also has a very seclusive piece of dialogue that can only be triggered if the first time we talk to her is in the Untended Graves. If we then go talk to her later at the Firelink Shrine, she says, Oh, thou art... Oh, no, isn't anything, Ashen One. This alludes that the Shrine Handmaid has recognised us from the original encounter at the Untended Graves, perhaps a time long ago in her past. The Shrine Handmaid also sells the rare hidden blessing, which can only be found in few locations, one of them being the Untended Graves. It's possible that the Shrine Handmaid found this in the past to sell at the Firelink in the future. So if we cast our minds back to the Untended Graves and the Arch Dragon Peak comparisons, Bubianis further relates the two locations together, albeit loosely, to suggest that the Arch Dragon Peak is also a capsule of the past. The main point of this theory is yet again the sky, with the bright blue sky and sun never relating to any of the sky in Dark Souls 3. So the Arch Dragon Peak definitely feels out of place compared to the rest of Lothric. But notice Corsorius counters this, showing in fact that there are many similar symbols in the Arch Dragon Peak and the Lothric Castle, which suggests that Lothric and the Arch Dragon Peak are indeed connected. But we could also argue that these symbols were around for a long time. They had to originate from somewhere. The Lighting Urn's description states that the Knights of Lothric were once hunters of dragons, but have since tamed the dragons. It's entirely possible that these knights tamed the dragons at their populace of the Arch Dragon Keep. It does seem more likely that the Arch Dragon Peak is actually in the present rather than the past. When the Ashen One is transported to the Arch Dragon Peak, even though we cannot see where we move to, we do hear something. 
Similar to other Dark Souls games, this could be the sound of the Wyvern, or another creature that is transporting you to the Arch Dragon Peak. But what about this ever-present sun? Well, this could be the doing of the Nameless King, in a similar vein to the sun that we see in Analondo in Dark Souls 1. The sun in Analondo is an illusion created by Gwendolyn, as when the illusion disappears, so does the sun. So perhaps the dreamlike state that Arch Dragon Peak appears to be in is actually due to an illusion it is being held under. As for the many connections between the Arch Dragon Peak and the Untended Graves, I would chalk this down to Osiris' consuming quest for the Dragon Powers, as he did become a dragon type mutant and carried a ring made from Dragon Scale. So of course the Arch Dragon Peak, the place of many dragons, would bear similarities with the place harboured by a man obsessed with them. So what does this make the Untended Graves then? Is it indeed the Firelink Shrine from the past? Another theory suggests that the Untended Graves is actually the real Firelink Shrine, similar to the illusions in Analondo, and our proposed illusions in Arch Dragon Peak. The Firelink Shrine that you can seemingly only warp to could just be an illusion, masking the real world of darkness where the fire has nearly completely faded. We can indeed walk to the Untended Graves through the Consumed King's Garden, but we actually can't walk to the Firelink Shrine. However, when Greerat of the Undead Settlement first encounters the Ashen One at the High Wall of Lothric, he states he heard the bell from the Firelink Shrine. And judging by the bell, you must be some of that unkindled ash. This means that this Firelink is at least in the same realm as the Undead Settlement. Another theory is that the Untended Graves is actually the Firelink Shrine, but in the future, or at least a vision of a potential future where the flame is not linked. Udix Gundir was indeed impaled by a coiled sword, but it doesn't necessarily have to be inflicted by the Ashen One. When Udix Gundir dies, he doesn't drop a soul, so perhaps he didn't actually die, but was just freed from the corruption of the Puss of Man, with this freeing having to take some time. And then when he returned, the flame was already extinguished. In the Untended Graves, we can also find a fragment of the Coiled Sword, which description states that it served its purpose long ago. Could this be the fragment of the same sword used to light the Firelink Bonfire, but many years in the future? Well, not necessarily. It could also have been a previous cycle before the events of Dark Souls 3. As for Yudis Gundy not dropping a soul, this could equally be argued due to the Ashen One already have taken Gundyr's soul back when he was the belated champion. I think it's most likely that if the Untended Graves is representing the Firelink Shrine, it would be that of the past. A pair of dark eyes, the eyes of a firekeeper, can be found in the Untended Graves. They were said to be the eyes of the first firekeeper, and the light that was lost by all firekeepers to come. When this item is shown to Ludloth of Corlin, he remarks, Ah, found her, did we? And the black eyes that shimmer within, I see. Tis as if it were but yesterday. We did all we could to spare her from them. Much has happened since. Is Ludloth subtly mentioning the eyes of a firekeeper, along with their resting place, the untender graves, are from a time long ago, where much has happened since. Now, it's time for us to travel the road of sacrifices into the body of the iceberg. Rosaria is Guinevere, chambered in the Cathedral of the Deep, seemingly confined behind iron bars and resting on her bed. Rosaria, mother of Rebirth, is an unkept cloud of mystery. Even though Rosaria is unable to speak, she's formed a covenant with her fingers. Those who hunt for tongues on her behalf. One of these fingers is Ringfinger Leonard, a masked man who can be found at the Firelink Shrine. His mask covers the scars of deep burns, a scolding which he received in his youth. He sought the mother of rebirth so that he could be healed and reborn, but after becoming a finger of Rosaria, he abstained from healing his injuries, and instead chose to serve the goddess as a knight. But as the story progresses, Leonard kills Rosaria, essentially ending the life of the one he swore to protect. But why would he do such a thing? If we invade Leonard, we can find him in Analondo with Rosaria's soul. Well, well, 
hell back for more, are you? Vicious one, aren't you? I knew it all along. And now you want to ravage her soul as well. One theory which Blue Manor Worm agrees with is that Leonard is actually crazy and obsessive over Rosaria. Leonard wants to protect Rosaria and he sees the offerings made by the Ashen One and the others as a threat to his position with Rosaria. And he wants all of her adoration just for himself, so he selfishly takes her soul. Or perhaps more likely, Leonard sees the other fingers as abusing his beloved Rosaria hurting and exploiting her for their own gain. And now you want to ravage her soul as well. This implies that something else of Rosaria has been ravaged according to Leonhard. Could this in fact be her body? So in Leonhard's reality, he is protecting Rosaria. But why take her to Analondo? Well, Rosaria's soul can be transposed into the Miracle Bountiful Sunlight, a special miracle that is granted by the Princess of Sunlight, Guinevere the loved mother and wife who bestowed their blessing onto many. Rosaria is somehow linked to Guinevere. But how exactly? I sow the seeds, I'll prune the mess. I, Leonard, swear so upon my vows to the goddess. No one will despoil her soul. Leonard himself denotes that Rosaria is actually a goddess. And in fact, his vows haven't actually been broken, even after killing Rosaria. His true quest is to protect Rosaria's soul, the connection to Guinevere. Now in the original Dark Souls, Bountiful Sunlight is also a miracle, and can only be used when the Chosen Undead is part of the Princess Guard, the Covenant of Guinevere. Tosman Dunn supposes that Rosaria could in fact be Guinevere herself, as the Bountiful Sunlight is in fact the miracle of Guinevere, and it can only be used when in her Covenant, being inseparable. Rosaria is the mother of Rebirth, while Guinevere is also seen as a motherly figure, so her core motherly values could have remained throughout time. So it is feasible that Leonhard is actually in Analondo, in Guinevere's chambers, to reform the Princess of Sunlight using the soul of Rosaria. The Funky Koi Fish proposes another theory, that Rosaria is in fact Gertrude, the heavenly daughter of Guinevere. The Miracle Bountiful Sunlight is in fact a more powerful version of Bountiful Light, a miracle that's taught to knights by Gertrude. So it's possible that Gertrude herself had access to a more powerful version of the miracle she taught, having received the miracle from her mother. The Divine Pillars of Light details that Gertrude is mute, while the Pale Tongue denotes Rosaria as also being mute. Gertrude was held prisoner in the Grand Archives, and there are similarities when observing the bars in Gertrude's cage and Rosaria's chamber along with man-grubs being present around both locations. But also in Gertrude's cage is a corpse. Dark Souls tells many stories with the placement of bodies, so it's strong reasoning to believe that Gertrude in fact perished in her cell. But the doors to the cell are opened, so perhaps Gertrude did manage to escape, making her way to the Cathedral of the Deep, and adopting the role of the Mother of the Rebirth, with perhaps a fallen soldier appearing as a corpse in Gertrude's cage instead. However, a lot of these parallels could simply be due to Rosaria and Gertrude just being related, thus closely linked. Tosman Dunn counters that the man grub found next to Gertrude's cage could actually be a result of Rosaria, who if was Guinevere, sent a man grub to go see her daughter. And perhaps, the man grub that Rosaria so possessively clutches in her bed could be the rebirth of Gertrude. But Tosman Dunn's theory does seem close to pure speculation. But out of these two theories, I still think it's more likely that Rosaria is a reborn Guinevere, rather than Gertrude. The Ring City Pygmy is the 30th Pygmy. As far as one can venture, located at the world's end, lies the Ringed City. The city was gifted to the Pygmies by the great Lord Gwyn, and it's also said to hold the Dark Soul. The forsaken Ringed City was warred off by the gods to contain the Pygmies. And the dark soul is better left well alone. One of the most important pygmies in the Dark Soul universe is the Furtive Pygmy, one of the original four lords. And the Furtive Pygmy, so easily forgotten. The identity of the Furtive Pygmy has been long speculated, as unlike the other three lords in the Dark Soul universe, their appearance remains ambiguous. 
but while the furtive pygmy lacks screen time, they definitely do not lack importance, postulated to be the ancestor of humanity. After the advent of fire, the ancient lords found the three souls, but your progenitor found a fourth, unique soul, the Dark Soul. So how could the furtive pygmy, a character of utmost importance, not appear in any of the Dark Soul games? Maybe that's not entirely correct. One of the more foundational theories is that in fact Manus is the furtive pygmy. Manus is the father of the Abyss, located under the city of Ulusil, which is slowly being absorbed by the Abyss itself. Manus is described as being a primeval human, meaning that of the earliest time in human history. So Manus could indeed be the first human, and being such a powerful individual, it makes sense that the power of the Abyss could be a result of Manus finding the Dark Soul, becoming mad, and spreading its power. But while Karth describes the furtive pygmy soul as unique, the soul of Manus is described as an extraordinary soul. Perhaps Manus is not the furtive one. The Ashen Hollow suggests that perhaps Velka is actually the furtive pygmy. The Vow of Silence is a miracle in Dark Souls that is the secret rite of the black hair witch Velka, having a great range of influence even as gods are concerned. With the Dark Soul said to be in the Ring City, rather than Ulusil, the Furtive Pygmy is more likely to have been in the Ring City due to the Furtive Pygmy being in possession of the Dark Soul. In Dark Souls 3, the Vow of Silence is now a miracle of the Sable Church of Londor. The Sable Church's decree is to usurp, permanently remove, the First Flame. In Dark Souls 2, Aldia describes the First Sin as Gwyn linking the First Flame. Now Velka is the Goddess of Sin, deciding what actions are sinful or not. So it would make sense that for an individual that would be linked to the dark, the lighting of the flame would be considered a sin. So perhaps Velka could actually be the receiver of the dark soul, the furtive pygmy. For a deeper analysis as to why Velka could be the furtive pygmy, have a watch of the Ashen Hollow's enjoyable video, Dark Souls 3 Lore, The Identity of the Furtive Pygmy. But I don't think that Velka being the furtive pygmy is that likely, with Miyazaki in the Game No Shukataku interview all but confirming that the furtive pygmy is male. And if we cast our mind back to the Dark Souls 1 introduction of the furtive pygmy, they state that the pygmy is so easily forgotten. Individuals such as Manus and Velka are quite memorable throughout Dark Souls. So perhaps, like the narrator suggests, the real furtive pygmy is somewhat easily missable in the Dark Souls universe. With the release of the Dark Souls 3 Ring City DLC, the narrative of the true form of the Furtive Pygmy continues. The final area of the Ring City reveals a barren wasteland sprinkled with ruins. Within these ruins are eight thrones, eight places to seat the Pygmy Kings. Drax and Nelly found seven corpses of Pygmies that can be found throughout the ruins, with the eighth Pygmy King being the last survivor, crawling his way to Gwyn's daughter Filianor. But while there are eight Pygmy Kings, the Dark Souls cinematic only mentions a single pygmy being the furtive pygmy. A statue can be found in the Ring City that seemingly immortalises Gwyn, crowning a single pygmy. Perhaps these individually shown pygmies are one of the same, and there is in fact a single pygmy, the true furtive pygmy apart from the eight other pygmy kings. Traxanelli does note that where the eight thrones can be found in the Ring City, there is a gap for a central ninth throne to have been placed. But it's been seemingly removed, perhaps easily forgotten. But who could have been this furtive pygmy, the ninth pygmy king? Could the evidence of this lost and forgotten pygmy still be within the Ring City? One hollow found within the Ring City has lost their memory, and cannot remember their real name, so goes with the name Lap. Lap in Swedish and Norwegian translate to Patch, and you can gain Patch's squat jester from Lap. So it seems that Lap is the persona of Patches, and King Shamu suggests that he is in fact the true furtive pygmy, an individual that's so easily forgotten, has in fact forgotten themselves, and returned to a place of utmost importance to them. I'll stick you in my prayers. A fine dark soul to you. Patches throughout the Dark Souls universe is secretive, guiltily slinking around the areas we encounter him, such as the tombs of the giants in Dark Souls 1. This fits the meaning of furtive, which is attempting to avoid notice and attention. 
unbreakable patches in Dark Souls 3 seems to have not lost his hollowing since we have encountered him in Dark Souls 1 and is one of the few to have not gone hollow. Perhaps a strong soul, such as the Dark Soul, kept him from hollowing. However, Patches does seem more likely to just be a recurring mascot throughout the Soul series. But perhaps this dismissive thought is what actually makes him the most easily forgotten of characters. Draxanelli emphasises this so easily forgotten message of the narrator, and brings to light the presence of a character that we are introduced to at the start of the Ring City. An individual who looks like a pygmy in resemblance, and indeed has the same voice actor. This hollow despises the gods, to curse the gods and bring ruin upon this accursed heap of dung. Which could relate to the actions of a furtive pygmy. So could this long, easily forgotten but important furtive pygmy be the easily forgotten mysterious Ring City Hollow? Now it's time for us to descend further into the catacombs of the iceberg. The Nameless King's name. The Nameless King was once the God of War, Slayer of Dragons, until he sacrificed everything to become allies with the Ancient Dragons. The Ring of the Sun's Firstborn actually links the Nameless King to the son of Gwyn, the First Lord, as his Firstborn was also a God of War, until he was stripped of his stature as punishment for his foolishness. His name has slipped from the annals of history, thus becoming the Nameless King. So the Nameless King did used to have a name, but what could it have been? Pocket Lint 60 supposes that the Nameless King is actually Faram. The Faram set in Dark Souls 2 and 3 is named after and blessed by the war god Faram, and they were designed in the style of the Lion Knights. What's also interesting is the engraving of the Faram helm, which depicts a dragon and a knight fighting, perhaps slaying the dragon, like what the Nameless King used to do. An item also found in Dark Souls 3 that could be related to the Nameless King is the war god Wooden Shield with a bizarre pattern featuring on the shield, betraying the mark of a mad god, revered as the god of war in remote regions. In Dark Souls 2, this same shield is known as the Lion-Clad Shield, which was said to have some sort of religious significance, but we will never know what sort of gods these warriors answer to. But these Lion-Clad warriors, perhaps Lion Knights, could have answered to the god of war, who went by Faram. Although Faram could just be the title that the Ferocens, the Land of the Lion Knights, gave to the King, with the Nameless King's actual name still lost, wiped from the history books. Another theory is that the Nameless King is actually said. A large stone fort, built as a proving ground for those who enter Analondo, Sen's fortress is full of pitfalls and traps. But why in fact is it called Sen's Fortress? In Japanese, the name translates to Sen's Old Castle. So who in fact is Sen? In our earlier Dark Souls Iceberg video, we discussed a theory that weapon craftsman Edis was in fact the architect of the fortress, so the fortress was named after him. Andre mentions that Sen's fortress is an old proving ground built by the ancient gods. So perhaps the creator of the fortress was an almighty individual. But unlike other powerful individuals in Dark Souls, Sen is never mentioned anywhere else other than the fortress. It seemed that only a handful of characters, Franft and Andre of Astora, actually knew the fortress by name. So perhaps the fortress's name is also being forgotten, attempting to be removed from history. Found in the Sen's fortress is many Silver Knight statues, with no real explanation as to why they were there. It's hypothesised that these statues could have been used in Sen's fortress as a training ground for the knights, having been trained by the Nameless King. So perhaps Sen's fortress is indeed the Nameless King's fortress, meaning that the Nameless King is Sen. The mimic found in Sen's fortress drops a lightning spear, which could yet again be a subtle nod to the Nameless King, with the God of War, who inherited the sunlight of Lord Gwyn, using a great lightning spear. Another interesting occurrence spotted by Bongasaurus Witch is the location of Ricard's rapier, which can be found in Sen's fortress in Dark Souls 1, and the Arch Dragon's Peak in Dark Souls 3 where the Nameless King can be found. And I don't really see any conflicts between the theories that the Nameless King is Sen and the Nameless King being Faram theories. The Nameless King could actually in fact be both of these, with Sen and Faram both being titles given to the King whose name has been removed from history forever. Slave Knight Gale is the bearer of the curse. The Slave Knight Gale acts as a protective figure to the painter, having resided in the painted world of Oriental for some time initially found praying at the Cathedral of the Deep, 
Gale was determined to burn the painted world, and using the ashes to create a new one, renewing the cycle. He pledges the loyalty to the painter, so much so that he obtains the Dark Soul from the Ring City, all while understanding it will be his ultimate downfall. Midway through the fight with the enlarged Gale, consumed by the Dark Soul, he realises that his blood is the blood of the Dark Souls, and turns hollow, realising that he has finished his goal of the Dark Soul, and places his trust in the Ashen One, hoping that they would return his blood to the painter. But apart from this, not much is known about the life of Gale. Where was he before the painting of Ariandel, and what made him so devoted to the painter? Nightboy42 thinks that Slave Knight Gale could be the protagonist from Dark Souls 2, the bearer of the curse. Dark Souls 2 has two different endings. One where the bearer of the curse proceeds to the throne, accepting their role in the cycle of the world. But in the other ending, the bearer of the curse can reject the throne entirely, walking away with the only motivation known by the bearer of the curse themselves. Nightboy42 supposes that with the second ending, the bearer of the curse is resolved to find another way rather than to come to the cycle of the world. Perhaps this other way is in fact the Oriental cycle, where they burn the world and use the ashes to create a new world. Gale, being the bearer of the curse, finally finds another outcome, and devotes his life to his painter's new option that he has been pursuing for years. While this theory does sound exciting, there are still many unanswered questions. How did Gale obtain the Slave Knight title? Slave Knights were said to be around long ago, when the undead served as Slave Knights, being fodder in the bleakest of battles. It's thought that the Slave Knights fought under Gwyn due to Gale's usage of the Way of White Corona, a long lost Way of White miracle, with the Way of White Covenant being followers for the great Lord Gwyn. So with this, it's thought that Gale actually predates even Dark Souls 2, having been around since Dark Souls 1. So perhaps this theory has too many holes to be true. What's below is uncertain, but let's drop down into the final layer of the iceberg, the deep sea. Aldrich is Smone, the saint of the deep and the devourer of gods. Aldrich had an unquenchable craving for human flesh, with his devouring of both flesh and soul bloating him so much so that he collapsed upon himself, becoming a massive sludge animated by the darkness. Despite this, he was still given many sacrifices by the followers of the Church of the Deep, which he founded. Aldrich was revived as a Lord of Cinder, and he began dreaming of the old gods, who supported the linking of the fire, and he sought to devour them. So he travelled to Analondo, capturing and attempting to devour the Dark Sun Gwyndolin. The blade at the end of Aldrich's staff seems to have a striking resemblance to the Greyfold Greatsword, which is the sword wielded by the Greyfold Nito. Aldrich's robe also seems very similar to Nito's, and looking at the floor around Aldrich, there are hundreds of bones of Aldrich's consumed victims. Like Gwyndolin, Aldrich could have consumed Great Lord Nito, absorbing his powers, perhaps on his way from his coffin to Analondo. Or perhaps just by consuming Gwyndolin, Aldrich gained the memories of other gods as well, allowing him to mantle Nito and consume the role of the Grave Lord. But the theory that interests me the most is one suggested by Miko Williams, and that's of Aldrich's identity before he entered his coffin. He proposes that Aldrich is Executioner Smoan. Granted, both Smo and Aldrich are encountered in the same cathedral in Analondo. Smo was also a cannibal, grinding the bones of his victims into his own feet. Let's take Aldrich for one, a right and proper cleric. Only he developed a habit of devouring men, and they made him a Lord of Cinder, not for virtue, but for might. Not for virtue, but for might would be an apt description for Smo. So could Smo really have been Aldrich? Perhaps Smo leaves the cathedral to look for another purpose, and ends up becoming a cleric for the Church of the Deep, while changing his name to Aldrich. But one thing didn't change, and that was his gluttony. He succumbs to his cannibalistic nature, and begins consuming, becoming more and more powerful and gathering followers who would provide sacrifices. Strangely, Smo's armour set does not become purchasable from the Shrine Handmaid until after the defeat of Aldrich. But I think these are more echoes of the Cathedral as opposed to parallels between Aldrich and Smo. While Smo is indeed a cannibal, he was a royal executioner and did not murder his victims. 
and afterwards he ground the bones of his victims, so they were definitely dead before he consumed them. But Aldrich had the desire to share with others the Jay of imbibing the final shudders of life, while luxuriating in his victims' screams. Even though they are both cannibals, the satisfaction they get from eating flesh is almost entirely different. But corruption does work in mysterious ways. Dran Lake is in the deep. The land of Dark Souls 2, Dran Lake, often seems quite dreamlike and disconnected from the worlds of Dark Souls 1 and 3. There are many theories as to why this could be the case, with the game occurring in Vendrick's dreams, or the entirely new continent of Dran Lake occurring in a different time. One proposal is that the land of Dran Lake is actually located in the deep, a dark sea in the potential coming age. The deep does seem to be very similar to the abyss, with one argument for them being the same presenting itself in the Wolf Knight's greatsword. This sword is more punishing against the creations of the abyss, and this bonus damage manages to extend itself to Aldric, and being the saint of the deep, he is very deep oriented. But the deep is definitely dissimilar in that it's cultivated a cult of worship, but perhaps their understanding of the abyss has branched off into what's now known as the deep. So curiously, the theory that Dran Lake is located in the deep actually spawned well before even the release of Dark Souls 3 itself. Chaos Spectrals proposed that Dran Lake no longer existed in the physical realm, but exists inside the abyss, as it was consumed. The land of Dran Lake has become prominent with the dark, warping and changing as the abyss influences. As we've explored deeply in our Dark Souls 2 Iceberg video, the lost sinner could have been imprisoned by trying to reignite the flame, bringing back the Age of Fire. Maybe she was imprisoned because in the abyss, the Age of Dark always reigned supreme. But what about the Broken Lord Vessel, an item we find in an abandoned mansion located in the Dren Lake town of Majula? How could an item from Lordran make its way into the abysmal realm? Well, Dren Lake's King Vendrick was said to have stolen something from the giants, so perhaps this item was actually the Lord Vessel. So now that we've laid the foundation that Dren Lake could have been in the abyss, why would it potentially be located in the deep of all places? Axis Cambria notes that from one of the windows of the Cathedral of the Deep, deep below, a dark lake can be seen. And if we cast our minds back to the beginning of Dark Souls 2, the opening cinematic also has the bearer of the curse falling through a lake, into the land of Dran Lake. Could these two lakes actually be one and the same? Intriguingly, we also find the Drang Hammers and Drang Set in the Cathedral of the Deep. The Drang set is very similar in appearance to the Llewellyn set in Dark Souls 2, and it describes how it was the armour of the Drang Knights, who were once feared swordsmen, until treason meant descending into the Abyss, and they were separated forever. Maybe the separation into the Abyss was in fact their birth into the world of Dran Lake, hinted at by their name. But it's important to note that through a lot of cut content from Dark Souls 2, the crux of Dark Souls 2 seems to be oriented around time travel, so potentially the intro of the lake is not the entry into the deep, but perhaps travelling through time. But the deep in Dark Souls 3 could be used to remove the reasoning of time travel in Dark Souls 2, as it didn't concretely make it into the final product of the game. But on the other hand, in Dark Souls 2, there is the Mace of Insolent, which describes its past wielder as a formerly high-ranking cleric, whose soul now wanders aimlessly in the depths of a murky darkness. Could this mace actually be a reference to Aldrich? And could this murky darkness actually be referencing the deep? Thus refuting our thoughts that Dren Lake is inside the deep. That distinguishes what remains of the Dark Souls 3 iceberg. If the tiny flame is still ignited and you want to explore more Dark Souls 3 lore, I recommend watching YouTuber The Ashen Hollow, who has made a huge collection of Dark Souls theory videos. Thanks again to the Jolly Onik for creating the original iceberg, which inspired parts of this video. And a huge thank you to you for making your way all the way through to the end of this video. Let me know what theories you have in the comments. See you next time.